If it's Monday, former President Trump putting his focus on the general election after a double-digit victory in South Carolina over Nikki Haley, as she heads the trail in Michigan, insisting that Trump's win is a warning for the party. Plus, battleground alarm bells. Michigan's Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer tells NBC News that she wouldn't be surprised if there was a significant protest vote against President Biden in tomorrow's Democratic primary. And the crunch on Capitol Hill. With just days to go until a partial government shutdown, House Speaker Mike Johnson under pressure from his right as the president prepares to meet with congressional leaders at the White House. Hello and welcome to Meet the Press. Now I'm Ryan Nobles in Washington. South Carolina, the last of the early primary contests is in the books. We've got one day until Michigan's primary and then eight days to Super Tuesday. And while former President Donald Trump keeps rolling toward the nomination, the path after the primaries may not be as smooth. Trump won the South Carolina primary Saturday night. It's his third straight double-digit win in a major contest. And in his victory speech, he made clear that he's got his eyes on the general election. An even bigger win than we anticipated. And I was just informed that we got double the number of votes that has ever been received in the great state of South Carolina. So. That's pretty good. In certain countries, you're allowed to call your election date. If I had the right to do it, I'd do it tomorrow. With this latest victory comes even more consolidation around Trump's candidacy. John Thune, the number two Republican in the Senate, has now endorsed Trump, saying the results in South Carolina made it clear he'll be the nominee. NBC News reports that Trump's team is also in talks for a potential endorsement from the Senate's top Republican, Mitch McConnell, who has been a frequent Trump critic. And Americans for Prosperity, which is, of course, the powerful Koch brothers-backed group, which has contributed significantly to Nikki Haley's campaign, announced it is ending its financial support. But Trump's growing strength in the primaries has also revealed major warning signs. The results make it clear that inside the Republican Party, there are still pockets of deep Trump skepticism. In South Carolina, a sizable 40 percent of primary voters went for Haley, roughly the same level of support that she got in New Hampshire. And on the campaign trail right now in Michigan, Haley is holding up that 40 percent as a flashing red light for her party. They'll talk about Donald Trump winning, and he did. I give him that. But what about the fact that in all the early states, he did not get 40 percent of the vote? You can't win a general election if you don't get the 40 percent. And then is he doing anything to help himself? No, he said anyone who supported me was barred permanently from MAGA. <laughs> now think about that. If you're running for president, your job is to bring as many people to you as possible, not push people out. But that's what he's doing. He's pushing people away from the Republican Party. And to Haley's point, in South Carolina, the former president had a lock on voters who identified as very conservative, the hardcore Republican base. But Haley beat him among more moderate or liberal Republican voters. And those are groups he's going to need in November. Haley's connecting with those voters, with a campaign that has ratcheted up its attacks on Trump as being unhinged and a weak general election candidate. It's a message that even has some top Democrats, like California Governor Gavin Newsom, cheering her on. I, I don't know why Democrats would want her out of the race. She's one of our better surrogates. I mean, she's defining the opposition to Trump incredibly effectively. I mean, she's making points I'm applauding every single day about his temperament, his capacity, uh, his, you know, unraveling in real time. Uh, and so I think it's I think she's been incredibly effective. So I hope she stays in personally. NBC's Ali Vitali is following Nikki Haley in Michigan. 
Ryan, it's day two of campaigning in Michigan for Nikki Haley, and she remains defiant in her posture that she is staying in this race, even as Trump does things like remake the Republican Party in his image. It's what Haley is now calling his personal playpen. She's saying his plan is to install allies and even family members atop that apparatus so that he can use it as, again, in Haley's words, a slush fund for his legal fees. Those are just some of the warnings that she's giving here in Michigan. Listen to all the things that she's calling red flags that she's now waving in this final stretch of the campaign. Watch that. I'm giving you every red flag I possibly can about the direction that the country's going in. Now I just need people to hear it. I need states that are voting to act on it. And I need to see that we can stop this sinking ship before it takes off. I think that if I'm not an alternative in this race, I think that Donald Trump will lose. It's that simple. Haley ending there, as she often does, with an electability argument. But look, it is going to be a slog here throughout these next few days and these many, many states that Haley is traveling to. Michigan, of course, votes tomorrow in its Tuesday primary. But then Haley starts jumping through the Super Tuesday states. And even as the rest of the field does things like take the would-be general election to Texas, of course, Biden and Trump going to the border, Haley, in response to that, saying they're not ignoring her out of the race. Instead, she's saying they're playing catch up. She already made that border trip several months ago. Ryan. All right, Ali Vitale, thank you. Joining me now on set is my NBC News colleague Garrett Hake, who's of course following the Trump campaign. NBC Shaq Brewster is on the ground in Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's in Kent County, one of our deciders counties to watch for in November. And NBC Steve Kornacki is where else? He's at the big board with some insight from Saturday's race in South Carolina. So Garrett, let's I'll start with you. Uh, now, Trump said Saturday night the party's never been as unified as it is now. But he lost two in five votes in South Carolina. It's enough for a pretty convincing win, but what does it mean for him in November? Yeah, look, I think he's right about the structural party. You see where the endorsements are across the House, Senate, governorships. He's basically taken over control of the RNC despite only having been through four states on the calendar. In that sense, he's right. But the warning signs are there for him that it's going to be tough to put together a coalition of not just Republicans, but Republicans, independents, disaffected Democrats, the kind of people you need to win in the swing states that matter come November. It's not clear to me the degree to which the Trump campaign has really started to grapple with this problem yet and how much they're just banking on kind of the inverse of the Biden strategy, which is to say, we think voters think Joe Biden is so bad, they will come back to us eventually. I have not seen a robust effort from them thus far to kind of convince those Nikki Haley voters they belong in the tent with Donald Trump, as mm -hmm. she said herself in that soundbite. Going around and saying you're out of MAGA forever right, if right. you still support me, it's not exactly a unifying message. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's hard to believe that this is the third Donald Trump campaign mm -hmm. that we've covered, but we've been through this situation <laughs> yeah. before where there's this idea that he's going to pivot, focus on his general election opponent, and get rid of the personal grievances. Is yeah. there an effort to try to do this again? It's been pretty unsuccessful in the past. Oh, yeah, sure. There's another effort. But, uh, you know, we wrote this story over the weekend about the effort to try to get Donald Trump to pivot now. And this is sort of an inflection point for the campaign. But I would argue some enterprising journalists could probably have written this story about every six to eight weeks over the last, you know, <laughs> eight years, because there's always been this push from inside Donald Trump's orbit and from outside within the Republican Party to try to make him a more acceptable gen uh, general election candidate or to try to make him look more traditionally presidential. And while he can sometimes, you know, kind of bend himself into that direction for short periods of time, it has never sustained itself over a long period. I mean, I think about a pivot in terms of basketball. You pivot enough times, you're basically right back <laughs> yeah. where you started. And I think that's what we may ultimately see uh, from Donald Trump. That said, this is certainly the most disciplined campaign apparatus around him. Mm -hmm. They understand the tools that are available to him to get him there. But at the end of the day, it's still Donald Trump. Right. He's going to do what his uh, you know, instincts right. tell him to do whenever he's in public. And you, and you talk about that professional campaign apparatus, and perhaps this next uh, story we're going to talk about is a good example of this. If we're up to Donald Trump, he'd probably tell Mitch McConnell to take a hike. Yep. But his professional campaign apparatus is campaign manager Chris LaSavita and uh, those in the McConnell orbit are trying to find some sort of a reunion between these two guys. What's happening there? Yeah, that's right. And by the way, I think the outreach has come from the other direction, actually. I think mm -hmm. it was the McConnell team that started looking for some kind of rapprochement with Donald Trump. McConnell's the last remaining member of House or 
for Senate leadership who, in the Republican side who's not endorsed Trump. They haven't spoken since Jan before January 6th. There's no love lost between the two men. But McConnell is the ultimate pragmatist. And if he wants to continue in the role of leader of the Senate, he's probably going to have to at least have some kind of working relationship with Trump. That's probably going to involve an endorsement. Those conversations are underway now. I couldn't tell you when, but I think it's more likely than not to happen at some point in this primary. And that is pretty remarkable. Okay, Garrett, thank you as always for that great reporting. Let's go to Shaq now, who's in Kent County. Of course, he said that's one of our deciders counties that we're following ahead of the November election. So, Shaq, you've been talking uh, to voters there about a potential Trump-Biden rematch. And what are you hearing? <laughs> I tell you, Ryan, they're not happy about it. And look, these voters, they know they have a primary. Primary day is tomorrow. They'll participate in that primary. But they see the writing on the wall. They see that both Joe Biden and Donald Trump have been dominating their respective party primaries. So when asked about the likely matchup that we'll see in November, here's how they've been explaining it. Um, scared <laughs> and Why sad. Scared? Just because I have no idea which one I would pick. Like, you know, I don't feel comfortable picking Joe Biden, but also I don't feel comfortable picking Trump either. I think that they both need to step back and not run. I think they're too old and they're too out of touch, and I think at this point it's just more like a pissing match. There's a lot of fear. Like, this is going to, what 2024 is going to bring is just that hyper-partisan explosion that, you know... January 6 times 12, I guess. So, and there's a worry, I think. You feel like folks are worried about? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's like, it's, it's not going to end well, I think is what people... No matter who wins. Yeah, yeah, because you're going to have 49% and 51%, and the 49% are going to try and invalidate the election. And that is the exact sentiment that Nikki Haley is trying to tap into as she remains in this race. When she attacks Donald Trump, she ties Joe Biden to him as well and saying, hey, you guys don't like these potential nominees, so I can be the alternative. But as you guys have been talking about, there's a heavy hill, a, a big hill, uh, uphill battle that she has to face if she wants to really stop his momentum at this point, Ryan. Yeah. And Jack, you know, you cover Midwestern politics for us. So you're around this a lot. I mean, drill down why Kent County in particular is so important this November. Yeah, it's a county that you've seen reflected, at least the trends that you've seen here have been reflected across the country. This is a county that was a reliable Republican county. Then you saw in 2016, Donald Trump only won it by about three percentage points. In 2020, Joe Biden flipped the county as he flipped Michigan. So these are more moderate voters, swing voters. It matters how people feel here because they can change the margins, not just here, but in uh, counties like this across the country. And when you have voters here saying, I don't like any of the options, well, that spells trouble for both options, for both candidates, uh, when you look to the general election. No doubt about that. Shaq Brewster, thank you so much. All right, let's go to the big board now and Steve Kornacki. Uh, Steve, obviously, a lot of information in those South Carolina exit polls. In your analysis, what do they tell us about November? Yeah, I think it really just reinforces some dynamics that we've known for a long time, to be honest. And it's sort of stark when you look. Here's the results, you know, by county statewide. You see there are three counties here that Donald Trump did not carry. The state capital, Richland County, where Columbia is. And then here in the low country, Charleston, right next to its Beaufort County, that's where Hilton Head is. And it created an interesting dynamic. What I'm going to show you here is the results by congressional district. And this mattered because you, know, you see up here there were 50 delegates at stake, 29 of them went to the statewide winner, but then each one of these seven districts, if you won the district, you got three delegates. And you can see this is Trump red here. He won six of the seven districts, but he actually lost this district where Charleston, where Hilton Head is. So Nikki Haley did end up actually getting three delegates out of this state. But what is it that made this area so uh, hospitable to Haley and hostile to Trump? Well, it's demographics, and it's demographics we've known about for a while. Uh, it's an area, the counties here have some of the highest median incomes in South Carolina. In fact, one of the counties in this district has the highest median income in the state. They have among the highest concentrations of voters with college degrees. Uh, again, that's been a Trump hostile demographic, both in Republican primaries and in general elections. And frankly, especially when you look at 
at, at, at Charleston County itself. Charleston County is a county that Donald Trump lost in the November 2020 election to Joe Biden. He won South Carolina easily, but he lost Charleston County. And I think that's a feature we have to keep in mind when we're trying to analyze results from South Carolina or New Hampshire a month ago. It's a key to when you look at these uh, independent votes and, and, and votes in places like this to remember Democrats were allowed to participate in this primary. We don't know the exact number here, you know, but we have there's definitely folks in this primary who voted for Joe Biden who wanted a chance to vote against Donald Trump here. And the places you're most likely to find those voters would be, for instance, in Charleston County, which Joe Biden carried in 2020, which, again, has that type of voter that in primaries and general elections has been turning uh, against Trump and the Republicans. And it's the same in New Hampshire, where you know independents could vote. Democrats couldn't, but there's a huge number of independents in New Hampshire. And, and so I think what, one feature we've seen here in New Hampshire and South Carolina is there's a very, very motivated segment of voter out there, just in general, that is anti anti-Trump. And it kind of fits demographically what I'm describing here. Suburban, college educated, a bit higher income. It's one of the reasons Democrats have been doing so well in these special elections. They're swamping the polls every chance they get to vote against Donald Trump. And we have the rules like you have in South Carolina where there is no party registration. Anybody could come out and vote in this primary. I, I think that probably brought out some voters here um, who already were planning to vote for Biden and, and probably did in 2020. And that is the the risk for Donald Trump in the general election? Does he get buried too much in suburban areas? All right, Steve, thank you for breaking down uh, that for us. We appreciate it. Coming up, Washington braces for a potential partial government shutdown. It could be just four days away. We're live on Capitol Hill as congressional leaders prepare for a high stakes meeting with President Biden at the White House. Plus, I'll talk to one of President Biden's closest allies in Congress as the Democratic Party faces backlash from key voters in Michigan and beyond. Congressman and Biden campaign co-chair Jim Clyburn will join me. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Uh, you're forgiven if you feel like we just did this. But once again, the clock is ticking on Capitol Hill as lawmakers faced a fast approaching Friday deadline to avert a partial government shutdown. President Biden and the top four congressional leaders will be meeting at the White House tomorrow to discuss a path forward, if there even is one. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and House Speaker Mike Johnson are already pointing fingers over who's responsible for the stalled funding negotiations. Now, it comes to Speaker Johnson is struggling to navigate a razor-thin and unruly House majority, which ousted its last speaker for joining with Democrats to, well, prevent a shutdown. Joining me now is Sahil Kapoor, who is on Capitol Hill. You know, Sahil, it feels like this is a, a real possibility, a, a, a likely a, a partial government shutdown. How did we get here and, and why will it only impact some departments? Yeah, let me take those one at a time, Ryan. This is likely to happen until we see evidence to the contrary. Congress has to act to stop this shutdown. They only have about four and a half days left. And right now, we don't know if, when, or how they will avoid it. How we got here? Well, Congress punted three times in September, then again in November, and then again in January, even though Speaker Mike Johnson said he wouldn't do it in January. With these stopgap measures, by now, Congress would already be thinking about the following year's government funding deal, but they're still stranded on this one because they can't seem uh, to get it together. Now, why is this only part of the government? Because the last time around, Speaker Johnson uh, got this idea from one of his members to do the so-called two-tier CR, or what we called here excruciatingly as a ladder. <laughs> CR. That means part of the government shuts down at the end of this Friday at midnight. Let's show the graphic. That includes the departments of ag, uh, departments of energy, housing and urban development, transportation, and the VA. And then one week from Friday at midnight, the departments of defense, state, justice, and uh, others shut down. Will this laddered CR get a better result? That still remains to be seen. The clock is ticking. And as uh, you just pointed out, Ryan, they still don't have a deal. And like always, it does appear to be the fact that Speaker Johnson is having a hard time with the conservative wing of his party. Is there a strategy here to try and find a way through this? There's no magic bullet. Mike Johnson's strategy is to lower expectations, cut the best deal he can, and hope for the best. What he's doing is reminding Republicans, of course, that they don't control the Senate, they don't control the White House. Uh, he has tried to set expectations, saying that Republicans are going to have to settle for singles and doubles, that there won't be home runs and grand slams, in the words of one source I spoke to who described uh, Johnson's message to his members. The reason uh, Republicans care so much about this is that this is the culmination of what right-wing members want. This is a vehicle that has to 
to move, that Joe Biden has to sign this into law or there will be consequences. And some on the right see this as leverage to get uh, policy things that they want. Some of the demands coming from Johnson's right will never get through the Senate. Things like defunding President Biden's climate change in initiatives, defunding his student loan relief programs, cutting DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas' salary to zero dollars. That's never going to happen. So Mike Johnson's got to find a way out of this mess where he cuts a deal that just enough of his members can live with Ryan, that he doesn't get overthrown like his predecessor, Speaker McCarthy, did. Okay, just a couple of days to figure this out. Sahil, thank you so much uh, for that. And joining me now is South Carolina Democrat and Biden campaign co-chair, Congressman uh, Jim Clyburn. Congressman, thank you for being here. Uh, first, tell me what your level of optimism is, uh, if optimism is even the right word, uh, that a government shutdown can be avoided. Well, I mean, what's your message to Speaker Johnson right now? Well, thank you very much for having me. My message is very clear. Either come forward with a deal or maybe we have to do another CR, uh, contingent resolution. Uh, but we must not allow the government to shut down. I looked at those uh, agencies that we affected. One is the Department of Veterans Affairs. We ought not have our veterans with such anxiety at this particular juncture in their lives. So my uh, idea is come together, put a deal on the floor, something that you know will pass the Senate as well, and let's go forward. But let's not shut the government down. If we get to that point, the public knows full well that it's the, Dem the Republicans who are doing this, and I don't think they can afford for that to be the case. Now, in addition to government spending, the other legislation that remains stalled right now is the president's supplemental request. Of course, that's uh, funding for Israel and Ukraine. We know the situation in Ukraine is deteriorating. How serious of an effort is there amongst you and your Democratic colleagues for a discharge petition? Does Leader Jeffries have the votes to make that happen? Or is there some other legislative uh, procedure that you guys are working on to try and bring that supplemental to the floor? Well, I suspect we have all the Democrats uh, voting for it. I think by the time we get to that point, there'll be 213 Democrats. We still need uh, four votes from the other side. And if uh, the bill uh, were, uh, if we put in the discharge, I really believe uh, there is four or more uh, people on the other side uh, who, will, who will sign it. And it will pass the House uh, with a big number. Uh, so uh, I do believe this is serious. I have not talked to uh, Leader Jeffries about it, uh, but I think I know his thinking. Do you, you, do you think you can get every single Democrat to sign on to a discharge petition if aid to Israel is included? Because some of your progressive members have expressed some concern around that. Well, look, this is about trying to move a foreign affairs agenda along. I don't know of a single Democrat that's not for uh, support for Ukraine. I don't know of a single one. And if both these things are together, uh, it will uh, cause some consonance with some people. But I do believe that Joe Biden is demonstrating day in and day out that he is doing what's in the best interest of uh, the United States of America, of our allies uh, uh, around the world. And I do think uh, that we will get uh, a significant vote among Democrats for it. Now, I'm not going to say that everyone will vote for uh, the Israel, uh, as opposed uh, to what's going on uh, regarding the negotiations uh, with hostages. Uh, but I do believe the votes will be there uh, to pass it. Okay, let's uh, talk about the campaign now. Uh, and how do you expect President Biden to fare in Michigan tomorrow? Are you concerned at all that the campaign needs to get Democrats, the, or there's this effort, I should say, for uh, those to get Democrats to vote uncommitted in Michigan? Do you think that that's picking up any momentum? From what I hear uh, from my friends up in Michigan, uh, it is a, an issue, but it's not picking up any momentum. Uh, I do believe there are some people uh, who will cast a vote uh, along those lines, but I do believe that Joe Biden uh, will come out of this uh, in real good shape, uh, and I think the Democrats are going to be in a good place tomorrow evening. 
I, I, there's no doubt that Michigan, which has a significant Arab American population, is so crucial to the president's reelection bid. Are you concerned that some of these folks who may vote uncommitted uh, tomorrow then just maybe will sit out the election in November? Well, there's a long time between now and November. Uh, the way people feel today could very well change with these negotiations that are going on. I don't know exactly uh, what uh, may be in the deal, but if a good deal uh, is made, we get the hostages free, I do believe uh, that we'll be in good shape come November. Uh, I don't think that we can uh, uh, make any predictions today mm -hmm. for how people will vote come November. If we were to do that, uh, I don't know that any of us will be feeling comfortable uh, right now. Yeah, you get I, one poll, uh, Joe Biden is up by four, another poll is down by four. So what do we know? Yeah, I think we should all get out of the prediction business, Congressman. I agree with you there. Um, I wonder, though, do you have a message for your colleague, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib? She's been a very outspoken uh, voice in this effort to vote uncommitted. What would you say to her? Well, you know, I've said all of my life that we can be no more or no less than what our experiences allow us to be. And I know uh, a little bit about her experiences. She knows a little bit about my experiences. Neither one of us have ever lived in the other's skin. So I uh, will have no advice for her except to say uh, I am hopeful that when it's all said and done, we can come together, not just as a party, but as a people, and get this issue resolved. I understand her sentiments. I hear from people throughout my district about them, especially young people on college campuses, people within my own family. Uh, and so uh, I'm very sensitive uh, to what she is uh, uh, feeling uh, about this, and I understand it. All right, and then before you go, sir, I just want to ask you about the Republican results in your home state of South Carolina from over the weekend and this somewhat startling result from our NBC News exit poll, which said that 36 percent of voters in South Carolina believe that Biden legitimately won the 2020 election. Uh, that would mean that 61 uh, percent said no. I mean, what's your reaction to those numbers and what does it say about the state of our democracy? Well, that is within the Republican primary voters. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're getting 61% within that, then we've got to deduct uh, people who were not voting in that primary. And I don't think you're going to get a 61% showing any kind of majority. I think the majority of the people of South Carolina believe very strongly that Joe Biden won and won fairly. I do believe that you will continue to get those kinds of uh, results uh, among uh, Republican voters, whenever you uh, poll them in their primaries, but that's not the majority of the American people. I do have some concerns about our democracy. I have been talking about this now for a long time. When I raised this issue back in 2018, uh, that I did not believe that Donald Trump was planning to leave the White House, I was chastised for that. Uh, people criticized me, saying I didn't know what I was talking about. Well, I think everybody now sees what I was talking about when I said I consider Trump to be a Mussolini uh, and Putin a Hitler. And I still hold to that. And I think the people are beginning to see what I was talking about. All right, Congressman, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, Jim Clyburn, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. We'll see you when you get back here to Capitol Hill later this week. And we've got an update now on that wild scoop from my colleague Alex Seitzwald on the source of the, that robocall that had an impersonated person uh, of Biden's voice telling people not to vote ahead of last month's New Hampshire primary. Democratic operative Steve Kramer is now admitting to commissioning the robocall, confirming that he hired Paul Carpenter, a New Orleans-based street magician, to create it. In an interview with NBC News, Kramer expressed no remorse for the deep fake and claimed that he did it to draw attention to the dangers of AI in politics. He said that he's received a subpoena from the Federal Communications Commission. Kramer had been working for President Biden's primary opponent, Dean Phillips, at the time that that robocall went out in January. Both Phillips' campaign and Kramer have said that Phillips' campaign had no knowledge of the robocall or Kramer's involvement in it. 
Up next, NBC News sits down with Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer on the eve of the swing state's presidential primaries. What she said about the president's political standing, the battle over reproductive rights, and the long road to November. That's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. What do you say to voters who are concerned about the president's age? You know what, I say that this president has gotten more accomplished in four years than most of his predecessors. He's got an incredible amount of accomplishments done, and I have very, every confidence in his ability to serve out a full second term. What do you say to those people within the Democratic Party who would like a candidate, a younger candidate such as yourself, to replace President Biden? I would say the train's out of the station, get on board. Welcome back. That, of course, Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer speaking with NBC's Gabe Gutierrez ahead of Michigan's key presidential primary tomorrow, where President Biden is set to face his first swing state test of the 2024 election cycle. A group of Arab American voters are urging Michigan Democrats to cast a protest vote for uncommitted as a sign of anger with the president's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. Gabe asked Governor Whitmer about the uncommitted campaign and whether it could cost the president in this crucial swing state. Does President Biden have a problem in Michigan? I think in Michigan, you can always count on close elections. That's true no matter who's on the ballot. And that's why I think it's important that they are focused on Michigan. And I'm grateful that their agenda has shown um, problem solving and the values that we care about and that they are, are making progress. Do you think that they've been more focused in the last few weeks after you and other Democrats have sounded the alarm? And should alarm bells be going off for the Biden campaign in Michigan? Well, I think Michigan's the kind of state you can never take for granted, and nor should you. It's the most diverse swing state in the country. We have our primary earlier than usual, and a lot of people are not accustomed to voting this early in the process here, and so mm -hmm. reminding people that it's primary day. But we've got nine months until this general election, and I think there's a lot of good work yet to do here. But, Governor, did you answer the question, should the Biden campaign have been more focused on Michigan earlier? You know, I, the Biden campaign has been focused on Michigan, and I think that as we look at all the pressures that people are confronting, this administration has been focused on good paying jobs, mm -hmm. leveling the playing field for people, creating opportunity. And we've benefited in this state, whether it is the broadband that is being built across Michigan or the onshoring mm -hmm. of supply chains, good paying jobs. I think that their agenda has benefited Michigan, and they've been focused on us. And, Governor, we've been speaking with Arab American voters over the last few months. As you well know, many of them are increasingly frustrated with President Biden over his policy in the Israel-Hamas war. What if uncommitted has a strong showing in this primary? I think there will be a sizable number of votes for uncommitted. I think that it is... Um, every person's right to make their statement about what's important to them. And we know that the Arab community, the Palestinian community, the Muslim community, those are not all one and the same. There's a lot of, of pain. There's a lot of pain in our Jewish community, too. So people have the right to make their voices heard. The uncommitted organizers have said that they want to get at least 10,000 votes. Do you think they'll reach that? I think that that's possible, yeah. Is the president and his campaign taking that seriously enough? As you well know, the president won Michigan by just 150,000 votes or so. Arab Americans could make the difference here, and they are so frustrated with this policy. Have you spoken to the president directly about that? I have spoken with the president. I've spoken with a lot of people about it, and I keep very close with our Arab American community. Um, I understand that, you know, there is a lot of different feelings on this and strong ones and pain that people are feeling. And yet I also know that we have a president who is working 24-7 to try to bring calm to the region and peace to the region. I know that we have a president who cares about Michigan and Michiganders and all the people who call this country home. He is, I think, working incredibly hard to resolve what is happening. Now, in the inter interview, Governor Whitmer also addressed the recent Alabama Supreme Court ruling that frozen embryos are children and the ripple effect of overturning Roe v. Wade. This was an exact um, consequence of the Trump appointees to the United States Supreme Court. We knew that it, with Amy Coney Barrett's appointment, after two others before her, 
that Roe was very much at risk. Mm -hmm. No one should be surprised about this IVF implication. And guess what? If it goes this far, embryonic stem cell research could be next. That means people who are hoping for cures with juvenile diabetes or Alzheimer's or any of the panoply of issues that are have so much hope because of embryonic stem cell research, that too is at risk. We've been making that case. Now I think people are seeing that and the Republicans are trying to distance themselves, but we can't let them do that. Has President Biden been making that case on reproductive rights as much as he should have? Yes, I think this president has shown that he is absolutely supportive of a woman's ability to make her own decisions. He trusts women. He respects women. Everything from the executive orders that they've issued to the work that they do to the people they nominate to the courts <clears throat> tell you that. And you can catch more of Gabe's reporting on today's issue of the NBC News politi politics newsletter. That's from the politics desk. And after the break, when religion, courts, and politics collide, new reporting on the background and beliefs of Alabama's chief justice following the state's Supreme Court ruling that frozen embryos are children. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. The National Infertility Association announced Friday that some clinics will pause sending frozen embryos out of state after the Alabama Supreme Court ruling that frozen embryos are children. The fallout from that ruling has left patients seeking fertility treatments few options as clinics in the state suspend IVF services for fear of liability. The state's attorney general says he has no intention of prosecuting IVF families or providers. Meanwhile, Democrats in Alabama State House have introduced a bill declaring that the definition of a child does not include an embryo outside of a uterus. The state Supreme Court decision has also drawn attention to a once fringe religious philosophy after the court's Chief Justice Tom Parker, who cited the Bible in his concurring opinion, discussed his embrace of the Seven Mountains Mandate a belief that conservative Christians are meant to rule over seven key areas of American life. This was Parker the same day the Alabama ruling came down, speaking to a Tennessee evangelist. God created government. And the fact that we have let it go yeah. into the possession of others is heartbreaking. And that's why he is calling and equipping people to step back into these mountains right now. And joining me now to talk more about this is NBC senior investigative reporter Mike Hicksenbaugh. So, so Mike, in his concurring opinion, uh, the Chief Justice Tom Parker makes explicit references to the Bible. Tell us a little bit more about this justice and why his personal religious beliefs are reflected in this ruling. Well, you see from that clip there, Justice Parker has not been shy about expressing his view that America was founded as a Christian nation, whose laws should be rooted in a, a conservative evangelical interpretation of the Bible. And so you see that reflected in his opinion as he cites nearly two dozen times scripture for justifying the court's decision that embryos should be given the same rights as living children. Um, and so he, he writes that Alabama has adopted a theological interpretation of life, of, of the, a theological description of life. And therefore, we must look to the book of Genesis, which says all men are created at God's image. And so when you put those two together, you must conclude that, you know, no life can be destroyed without incurring the wrath of a holy God. And according to the court, that, that includes unborn uh, embryos. Yeah, and I mean, we are definitely seeing a, a rise in Christian nationalism on a national political stage. Does it look like it's just becoming more in, intertwined with Republican politics? I mean, I think it's first really quick important to define that term because we're hearing it a lot. Yeah. Christian nationalism doesn't mean um, that, you know, the idea that uh, Christians should see their views, want to see their views reflected in policy. It's, it's the idea, I point to the definition that Congresswoman Lauren Boebert gave, which is uh, the idea that the church is meant to direct the government, uh, the separation of church and state is a myth mm -hmm. cooked up by progressives. And, and so what we're seeing is that idea, the Seven Mountains mandate, as you, men as you mentioned, becoming embraced within the center of GOP politics and really prol proliferating 
in the years since Donald Trump rose to power and was kind of seen as an unlikely hero among mm -hmm. what, was, what, what was, was once kind of seen as a fringe sect of mm -hmm. American evangelicalism. And we, we do see some Republicans attempting to distance themselves from the ruling, uh, coming and being very vocal in their support of IVF. But, I mean, does this theology kind of run contrary to how they believe? I mean, it's, that includes Donald Trump, right? Right, and, yeah. But one day before he distanced himself, he spoke at a gathering of Christian broadcasters where he promised to a room full of uh, evangelical faith leaders, many of whom shared these views that Justice Parker expressed. He, Trump promised them he would give them unprecedented power in his new administration. And it is because of the federal justices that Trump appointed and the Supreme Court justices that this ruling even exists. And so I think it, it's important to test those uh, comments distancing themselves with their other promises and their actions in office. Okay, Mike Hickenbaugh, thank you for that reporting. We appreciate it. All right. Still to come, former President Trump and President Biden go head to head at the border with dueling visits set for Thursday. What to expect as the duo doubles down on immigration in 2024? The panel is next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. In another sign that President Biden and Donald Trump have their eyes on a November rematch, we learned today that both men will be visiting the southern border on Thursday, with the president appearing in Brownsville and Trump visiting Eagle Pass. This comes as the White House is trying to turn the tables on Republicans on this issue after House hardliners killed a bipartisan Senate bill to address the crisis. Meanwhile, a new Monmouth University poll shows that 84% of Americans now say that illegal immigration is a serious problem. That includes 61% who say it's a very serious problem. Those are the highest percentages that Monmouth has ever reported on that issue. And I'm joined now by my panel, Tia Mitchell, of course, Washington correspondent for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Fasha Kira, a Democratic strategist and former senior advisor to Senate Democratic leader Harry Reid, and Brendan Buck, the former press secretary to former House Speaker John Boehner and Paul Ryan. He's now an NBC News political analyst. So, Tia, is this just further proof, the fact that we're going to see both the president and the former president on the southern border here in a couple of days, uh, this just proof that the primaries are basically over? Yeah, I think so. And it's proof that both Trump and Biden know that immigration is going to be a huge theme of this presidential contest this year. And quite frankly, the subject of immigration, as this Monmouth poll shows, it's becoming a national issue, not just an issue for border states, but an issue that voters in virtually every state are concerned about. Mm -hmm. So it's something, especially for Biden, I think he wants to get try to get ahead of. Yeah, and, and as we saw in the special election in Long Island, Democrats kind of test run a message there. They kind of leaned into immigration. They accused Republicans of backing away from this bipartisan deal. Is it a risk, though, for President Biden to highlight border security as an issue? Could that be a liability for him? Yeah, in some ways, but I think he's already got, he's out flanking Trump on the issue. So they had a bill, they had a proposal. He's got the th theatrics and the performance art of this down. You got to go and show people that you are you are addressing the border, that you care deeply about it. It's not an issue that you're going to neglect. And I think, it, as you're suggesting, you can't look like you're deviating from your values. For a, a core of a progressive base who remembers you were for a DREAM Act, you were for a comprehensive immigration reform, you hated Trump's wall. You ha I think you can bring both of those together. But I think as he goes down to the border, the, 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 they're going to go to the same place, but they got to have different visions. <laughs> you, can't say, you can't say, like, I came to Texas to tell you that I'm Trump light. you got to go to Trump and say, he's wrong on this. I've got a different vision. Some of those pieces we agree on, but mostly we have a different vision. On this. Is it uh, enough just to focus on this, or I mean, should he be focusing more on things like reproductive I, rights? Uh, well, the, like that? the, that's a, a great point. I mean, the, ultimately, what you're hoping for is a Biden campaign that you're trying to mitigate the number of people who want to vote on immigration as the issue. Right. Because if, if this election is immigration, it's not going to go well for for <laughs> us, right? So you've got to decrease that salience. So what you're trying to hope for is a large number of voters say, "Hey." Okay, I don't see a difference, a, a, a significant difference between them enough to get me passionate about. So therefore, issues like choice, issues on the economy that might be more core to me, those are the things, and with democracy, those are going to be the ones I want to mm -hmm. vote on. That's, I think, the battle here. All right. Uh, Brendan, listen to what Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer told Gabe Gutierrez about the border. The Biden administration actually put a solution on the table, and the Republican Congress walked away from it. The best solution that has been offered in decades was on the table and the Republicans walked away. I think it is abhorrent 
that you've got a political party in this country that is more interested in scoring political points than actually solving a problem that this nation needs solved. It's kind of interesting, Brendan, because I remember when we were reporting this out, the, the idea was that Trump was spiking this deal to not give Biden a win yeah. as it relates to the border. Now Democrats are trying to turn this back on Republicans because they walked away. Is it effective? It might be, but they've got a lot of work to do. I mean, I think this can very easily devolve into Washington finger pointing. And, and the question is whether this is actually going to resonate with people. Certainly they gave Democrats an opportunity. But Democrats have a lot of room to go on this. Poll after poll show that voters pick Republicans as stronger on the border. And if border security is the issue, then that's a problem for them. And I totally agree that this is not about winning the issue. I don't think Joe Biden is going to win border security. But if he can take it down a peg and not make it as important. But this is not a fabricated issue. There's a lot. Of, there's always mm -hmm. been a lot of sense right. that, that Republicans have fabricated immigration as to be a problem that's not doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. People all across the country in lots of cities, in lots of states, not just at the border, know it's real. And I think the Biden administration clearly sees that now. And there's also a, another way that President Biden is trying to differentiate himself from President Trump, Tia, and kind of presenting himself as the problem solver, right? I have right. a plan to fix this problem. You're just complaining about it. Could that be an effective message as well? I think so. And, and I just want to, for Brendan's point, I think the it is real that there is an influx of migrants at the border. The, the numbers are overwhelming, not just border cities, but sanctuary cities. Mm -hmm. But I do think there is fear mongering from the right where it comes to, you know, there being criminals and drugs and, and some of that that we hear in the rhetoric that sometimes is seeped in racism or xenophobia. Mm -hmm. And that's what you often hear when Democrats say some of this is political posturing. That being said, um, I think there is room if we look at what are the actual problems and what are the actual solutions and what can get done. That's where you see Biden saying, I'm trying to address the problems and Republicans aren't willing to negotiate. I mean, that's the point you're making, right, yeah. Faz? That there's a way to approach this in a way to solve the problem as opposed to, to doing it in a way that is and, and harsh. Yeah. His point is right on that, you know, if you talk, everybody's coming across our drugs and uh, carrying fentanyl. No, of course not. Like, most of these people are asylum seekers looking for a job and looking for a better way of life and are fleeing like persecution so you have and the problem is just the vast numbers right they, mm -hmm. they're overflowing a system and you don't have a country that can secure itself house them do justice to them quite frankly and so the issue i mean one of the issues quite frankly that i've longed for democrats to discuss is corporate exploitation of people coming across the border you've got people who are coming across and you have corporations saying hey these are cheap labor and I can drive down wages of American workers. Now, when you talk about that, obviously you have to know, know and own that many of the humans coming across also are just looking for a better way of life. So mm -hmm. in some sense, they're, they'll take that five, $10, a job, a $10 an hour job, mm -hmm. but really it's exploitation by people who want to take advantage of them. Right. And I think that's always been a message out there for Democrats because you've had a lot of large corporations in America be comfortable with, oh yeah, you know, we want that cheap labor. You know, Brendan, I wonder too if, uh, if the Democrats, the Biden administration in particular, is missing an opportunity Opportunity here. I had a friend visit Arizona recently. The local news was filled with stories about local law enforcement releasing some of these uh, detained migrants because they couldn't afford to house them anymore, in part because they don't have the federal funding to support it. You know, part of this bill was providing these uh, different law enforcement agencies the ability to continue to fund this. But I feel that gets lost in the coverage. Is that is that a way that the Biden administration could do a better job of, of messaging in that to voters that are concerned about yeah, this? Yeah, it's not a dynamic to, about it that we usually talk about, but this is what's happened. The, 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 the influx has gotten so big that there are cities all across the Midwest, Northeast, that they're, they're all seeing, and they're in their communities. And I, I do a lot of work with, with mayors in, mm -hmm. in my day job. And they're all saying, we need help. There are people coming where we want to be welcoming, but there's no, we don't have the resources to do it. Um, Yes, it ultimately comes down to Congress, and Congress is a very good place to, 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 to attack. If you want to have a contrast, <laughs> the House Republican right. conference is ready to, to, yeah. to, to take it on. <laughs> yeah. So um, that can, you can take it to a lot of issues. But yeah, if, if you want to contrast yourself with Congress, I think that's a very good place to start. All right, we have less than two minutes, probably not enough time to get into this, but Brendan, how soon will Mitch McConnell endorse Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, I'm... I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Are you surprised that it could come? Yes, that's what I'm saying. It's hard for me to actually see this happening. I know that he's the most pragmatic politician and he's going to do whatever he needs to do to keep the team together. But I also think he's somebody who's probably on his way out before too long. And I don't know that he really wants to do that for his legacy. But he is Mitch McConnell. He'll probably do what's best for winning Senate seats. So it's probably nearby, but it's still just 
He won't even say his name, so I don't know how he's <laughs> going to endorse yeah. him. Does it surprise you, Tia, that he eventually could come around? No. I mean, that's what we're hearing from so many Republicans. I, You know, the AJC had a radio show this morning, and I was asking a top Nikki Haley surrogate. She's saying all these things about how problematic Donald Trump is, how he's wrong on so many in so many issues, but then she'll turn around and say, but I won't vote for Joe Biden. She's indicated that if Trump is the nominee, she'll still vote for him. And we see how she talks about Donald Trump Unfortunately, a lot of Republicans feel that ultimately they will need to fall in line. And they also believe that as wrong as they think Trump is, they think President Biden is worse. And so that's where we see a lot of them landing as it becomes inevitable that Trump will be the party's nominee. Fazer, does it surprise you anymore that Republicans just end up falling in line behind Trump? No, I, mean, I actually would have expected more. I mean, I, I'm actually surprised. There's the Hold Your Nose Caucus is growing mm -hmm. in the Republican ranks. If you look at the way Ron DeSantis talks about Biden, he's still criticizing. You see Haley, there's actually an establishment of conservative politicians who are thinking about a day and age when Trump is no longer here and wanting to be... In some sense, the voices who said, hey, I was never really along for that ride anyway. And so my appeal to Mitch McConnell's conscience is don't do it, Mitch. Just <laughs> like go out, go out this way. Just, hey, you know, I, I, I didn't do what was politically it, demanded right. of me because I had a conscience. Advised uh, uh, Harry Reid, Bernie Sanders, and now Mitch McConnell. <laughs> we'll add that to your resume, Faz. <laughs> Tia Faz, Brendan, thank you all for being here. And thank you for being with us this hour. We're back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. But NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.